tau pupe i kau kau mai te mokupu wānanga hua tu tako rākau ki a tohia. Tohia a nuku tohia a rangi, ka puta te whai au te o marama ti he mauri ora. Uh, kia ora mai tātou. Tato, um, co uh, Debbie Chin, aho. I am the board chair of Taurus Compass Health, and it's my pleasure to be here today um, with my colleagues and the team here at Waikanae Health um, to welcome Dr. Shane Letty, um, the Minister of Health, for the announcement today. I want to start by extending my thanks to the team here at Waikanae Health um, for hosting us at their wonderful facility. The team have looked look after almost 9,000 enrolled patients with over 60% aged over 45 and 22% um, with CSC card holders. Just a little bit about Toro Compass. As a PHO, we're very much part of the landscape of general practice in New Zealand, supporting a network of um, nearly 60 practices with an enrolled population of nearly 350,000 people across Wellington, Kapiti and Wairapa. Um, I'd like to thank Tora Compass as one of the best, if not the best, PHO in the country. And of course, as chair, I do have some biases there. Um, Tora is innovative, and over the years, with the partnership model and licensing that has been established um, with the previous DHB, uh, we have developed a very high trust partnership model. This has enabled us to be innovative and deliver more for our patients, closer to home, thereby reducing attendance at ED and better care for patients. And certainly, as you know, Minister, we can do much more to improve access for our patients and reduce pressure on hospitals. As an example, Tora and the team at Waikanae Medical have been very proactive in our work to diversify the workforce to look after the community in the Kapiti Coast. We have embedded the core elements of lean thinking with our model healthcare home into the business as usual, and this continues to innovate, um, provide innovation in the practice. This includes extended care teams, um, showing a strong team approach to healthcare. Each GP at the clinic has 45 minutes dedicated to triage each morning, with the practice averaging 28 calls per day. The practice also holds um, a hospital discharge clinic weekly. The team also provide proactive care planning through several weekly diabetes and cardiovascular assessments, nurse lead clinics, enhancing this further in the near future with a holistic approach. The team also engage well with their patients through new letters. And some notable achievements include high level um, of people registered with electronic health record with a 70% activation rate, well, much higher uh, than the rest of the country. The team consistently maintain their healthcare home quarterly um, clinical targets. And during 2023, um, the team maintained a time to third next appointment of two days or under a key measurement used nationally to measure patient access. I'm incredibly proud of the efforts of the team here at Waikanae and all our practices in our network and the hard work that Tora team and our partner PHOs have done to support our communities. I also want to acknowledge the opportunity to, um, to acknowledge the innovation of our PHO-owned telehealth service, um, Practice Plus, and its partnership with Kaiora providing rural telehealth services. Now I want to, now want to introduce the Minister of Health who needs no introduction to, to this esteemed group. Having said that, just a few points to note. Um, Dr Shane Retty is a GP and has continued to maintain his practice while in Parliament. I don't know how you find the time at the moment. Um, he's passionate about general practice and coming in as a minister 
where there was uncertainty, you have given us certainty as PHO, thank you. In terms of direction, you have given your support to sustainable primary care, and most critically, you understand and support the role of primary care where communities can access most of their health care. So I'll now hand over to the Minister for his announcement. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, kia ora mātato, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, Atawa tuatahi uh, ki te mana whenua a uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, e pai ana ko puta mātato ki kune e tēnei rā mo te tahe ki te whakawhiti pakaaro o e pā ana tēnei mahi hihira. Nō reira tēnā koutou. Uh, ki te Waikanae uh, Clinic, uh, ko tēnei takumihi ki a koutou uh, hoki, uh, nā mihi ki a koutou uh, to the Waikanae Clinic. Thank you for having us this morning and greetings to you as well. Uh, Debbie, thank you for your uh, kind introduction. I'd like to acknowledge to order and the team here at Waikanae Health Centre uh, for having me here today. I bring the apologies from the Minister of Finance. She got caught up in another matter. She sends her apologies. And I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague, the uh, MP for Otaki, uh, Tim Costley. Thank you for joining us here today and for being the voice of the community, Tim. That's much appreciated. <coughs> Budget 2024 has delivered a strong platform for our economy to grow and for New Zealanders to be better off. We have made hundreds of savings and reprioritisations to deliver funding to the front line and to ensure Kiwis get the tax relief they deserve. As a government, one of our core priorities is focused on building a health system that's more efficient and provides New Zealanders with timely access to quality health care. Radiology is key to accessing that care, helping health professionals give accurate diagnosis, which then enables effective treatment. Access to diagnostic radiology services is currently inconsistent across New Zealand. In some places, New Zealanders are waiting longer, making additional payments for scans or travelling long distances to radiology appointments at their own cost. I am pleased to announce that we are investing $30 million through Health New Zealand to level up access to X-rays, CT scans and diagnostic ultrasound across New Zealand and to ensure that primary health providers can refer patients directly where clinically appropriate, rather than waiting for a specialist assessment. The investment also includes targeted support packages to cover travel for people who can't access radiology services locally. This will particularly benefit people living rurally. Currently, access to radiology for GPs varies according to previous district health board rules. This has meant that, for, for instance, people living in the Hutt Valley don't get the same access to radiology available to people living in Wellington. This initiative to be implemented over the next two years aims to address those inconsistencies so New Zealanders are getting the same community-referred free access to radiology services when they need them. This investment will mean primary and community health providers across the country like the ones we're visiting today, will be able to refer patients directly to radiology services with no co-payment once the scheme is fully implemented. $30 million is enough to fund around 150,000 additional radiology interventions, depending on the mix between X-rays, ultrasounds and CT scans. One example of where this funding can have a significant impact is for people suffering, for example, with gallstones or kidney stones. GPs will be able to refer their patients directly for diagnostic ultrasounds, which they will then be able to access within a clinically appropriate time frame. The first investment will be in Wellington and the Hutt Valley, where we are equalising access to radiology by investing $2.6 million annually to reduce co-payments and recognise increases in imaging numbers as the population becomes older and more complex. With access to diagnostic imaging, Community and primary health care providers can make better decisions about where to refer patients next or whether they can provide care closer to home. Patients benefit by getting definitive answers quickly rather than awaiting a hospital specialist for an imaging referral. This is a prime example of where we're looking for ways to bring health services closer to communities, provide consistent and quality care to Kiwis no matter where in New Zealand they live, and prioritise funding where it will have the greatest impact. This initiative will also contribute to achieving our government's key health target of reducing wait times for first specialist assessments. One can imagine this would reduce the number of specialist referrals for conditions that can be treated directly in primary care and increase the efficiency of specialist assessments as patients can show up with their ultrasound and scan results and diagnosis, their presumptive diagnosis, in hand when they see the specialist. Finally, this development responds to a call from GPs for more consistent access to radiology. 
As far back as 2014, the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners has called for consistent and equitable primary health care access to appropriate radiology services across New Zealand, giving GPs better access to radiology reflects their skills and experience as specialists in family medicine. So imagine how this might be. Uh, you have a patient come in potentially, say, with gallstones, a presumptive diagnosis of gallstones. What you would normally do is you would refer that up to the hospital. They would go on a waiting list for a first specialist assessment. They then see the specialist who says, oh, you need an ultrasound. They then go away. They have a period of time before they ultrasound. They then turn up to the specialist with that ultrasound in their hand and they can progress forward. Under this protocol, what will happen is GPs uh, will be able to refer to a referral hub which will make a decision where the capacity is and the timelines required for a presumptive diagnosis of gallstones, for example, uh, where the capacity sits, whether in that timeline it still sits in the public sector or actually it sits out in the private sector. And the referral hub will then generate that referral. The scan will be done. People will turn up at their first specialist assessment with their scan in their hands. Even before then, the referring GP will have some indication, yes, my presumptive diagnosis of gallstones or kidney stones or whatever it may be uh, is correct, and I can make some progress while the person is waiting for a first specialist assessment. So as you see just in that example, it reduces the number of specialist assessments to just one in that first instance, significantly reduces the time from presumptive diagnosis, this is what I think it is, until you get the X-ray in your hand, now I've got a definitive diagnosis, significantly reduces that time frame uh, as well. So this is a significant uh, contribution. Canterbury have actually had a similar system. This is where we're wanting to harmonise this across the whole country. They have been using health pathways and other ways to advance radiology. Now we're going to roll that out and extend it across the whole country, and we're starting with Capital Coast and, uh, and Hutt Valley here. So uh, this is the announcement that, uh, that I'm making this morning. Happy to take questions. You said that our population is getting older and mm. more complex. How concerned are you about our capacity to cope with this, say, in the next 10, 20 years? We've, we've talked about the tsunami of uh, older people coming towards us as the population ages. And what we know, as people age, obviously uh, issues of frailty and increasing comorbidities and increasing medication requirements go up. And so this is something we're factoring into a health system into the future. What does that older person, uh, I wouldn't call it a bulge, but that older person surge, what are the impacts on the health system for that? What does it mean for age residential care? What does it mean for geriatricians? If we break that down, what does it mean for the policies? What does it mean for the infrastructure? What does it mean for the health workforce? Uh, particularly, I would contend we don't have enough geriatricians, actually. What does it mean for primary care? In fact, we were having some of those discussions outside before we came into this room, around how consultations generally with older people, not surprisingly, take, take longer. They don't fit well into your standard 15-minute general practice consultation. And so these are some of the models of care that with Debbie and, and others at, uh, around PHOs that we're looking at how do we reflect the primary care adjustment required to take into account this increasing uh, older population. Did, what sort of uh, conversations did you have with the um, pharmaceutical, uh, with the um, pharmacy industry around the return of the co-payment date? Uh, so we had discussions with the uh, Pharmacy Guild uh, indicating that uh, we would be likely bringing the co-pay back in uh, in the new financial year. And what sort of reaction have you had since then? Oh, uh, since then, uh, understandably, uh, there's been some concerns around um, will that be increased administration? Will we go back to sort of having to call up and find if a person has a community services card? Uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, what we've done is we've implemented information technology so that, that automatically happens in their software system. So we've looked to reduce the burden uh, on pharmacists as the copay goes back. And what about the decision to keep under 14s free? Was that kind of more of a um, sweetener for the pharmacy industry? No, it was always a default. Uh, we just didn't change the default. That, that, that's been there for a long period of time, uh, I think almost a decade as I recall. So no, that, that just sat there. We didn't change that. So is there new research shows um, 5.2% more people year on year are being rejected when referred for specialist care by their GP. Why, uh, how did we get to this sort of point? Yes, I saw that. I thought that was interesting in as much as that it would seem that uh, referrals were less uh, for those who are older and those who are younger and referrals were less, uh, less declined. Uh, if you like, for older and younger, which is good, and uh, also for Māori and Pacifica, which is good from an equity uh, balancing perspective as well. Look, this talks to the uh, two things. First of all, the unmet need that is out in the community, 
um, those that haven't even got into the referral process, and then the capacity we have or do not have uh, in the hospital system to deal with those referrals as they come forward. And, and indeed part of what we're talking about today is part of you know, remedying that if we can. So you saw, I, I saw that report. Um, I thought it was interesting the various cohorts uh, where actually they had less declined referrals than others. Are you mm. satisfied Health New Zealand has <coughs> been transparent about the numbers needing specialist services as Look, uh, I think uh, as much as we can tell uh, with the data that we have, uh, we know what clearly touches the system. <clears throat> it's always a bit unknown as to those who don't actually make it. So if we can imagine last year, I think it was July and August, uh, it was Christchurch, as I recall, sort of closed off referrals full stop uh, from primary care. Clearly that unmet need pool would build up. And uh, what we've seen with this report is uh, they've gone out and sampled and surveyed, said, now let's get a sense of actually how much are not even touching the system, because we need to take them into account uh, as well. That's what I'm seeing from this report. Should Health New Zealand um, regularly report all those being referred for treatment, not just those on waiting lists? Uh, look, I think I'm not 100% sure that they don't. I would have to check uh, whether that's not a system level measure already. I don't, don't have an answer for that. I'd have to have a look at that. Can you give um, some clarification as to when you expect those 13 cancer treatments to be funded? Sure, what we've said is that we'll be making announcements soon, that we're committed to the 13 treatment, treatments as we've announced them, and that we'll be making announcements soon. No, you you well, and the Subject Finance Minister both indicated that it would be for the next budget that the Prime Minister has said this year, so when is it? That's implementation. The announcement we'll be making soon. So, no. so we can't expect the drugs to actually be here until next year? Uh, no, that's not correct. What I've said, we'll make an announcement soon, which will describe what the implementation plan looks like. Can, can you also clarify your comments to the Chair? Yes, I can. What I can uh, <coughs> confirm is that the uh, the funding that will, the revenue that will attribute to the copay, uh, will go into a into a bucket that will contribute towards the 13 cancer treatments. That's what I've always said. Is there any <coughs> chance that you could add blood cancer medicines to that list regarding the cancer control agencies and health that's coming up? So look, uh, we're committed to what we uh, took out to the campaign trail, and at that point, the uh, hematological uh, cancers were actually on that list. Uh, what I will reflect is that in the past six months, Pharmac has funded acute myeloid leukaemia, one of the cancer medicines, and has an RFP out at the moment for hematological myeloma. Um, so there is some relief, uh, pharmacological relief, for the hematological uh, cancers already in the pathway. Um, but we're committed to what we announced um, on the campaign trail. Are you, um, are you anticipating the analysis finding any gaps in that area, though? Oh, look, I wouldn't want to preempt. Um, what the uh, Cancer Control Agency will bring forward. Um, we'll need to see that see that report first. Just mm. on Holidays Act changes, hundreds of thousands of workers are still owed money due to Holiday Act payroll problems. Is there enough money in the health and education budget to pull those staff? Uh, certainly for health, uh, we've taken this into account. A, a significant part of the complexity has been bringing together 20 disparate payroll systems, older payroll systems at that. Uh, there is a schedule. Uh, for payments, and those payments for Holidays Act, certainly in health, will be those who are currently employed, and then it will be those who have left employment, how we catch up with them. So that's, that's the schedule um, at the moment to address uh, Holidays Act remediation. Can I, just go back to, can I just go back to Lillian's questions around the communications around the cancer funding? Sure. Do, you think, do you think that the government has kept a high enough standard to what you're um, telling the public? Because it is quite confusing. When, you know, people should have certainty, shouldn't they not? So I think we've already acknowledged that our communications uh, could have been better, and um, we're looking to do, to do better going forward. We've already acknowledged we could have been better with communications. I think you've heard the Minister of Finance say that as well. Mm. Uh, Liz, will this government continue to fund free rap tests beyond June 30? Yes. Okay. Is, we're hearing, we're hearing that there are some pharmacies uh, saying that we've run out of free rap, so do we have a shortage at the moment? Oh, that hasn't been conveyed to me, and I'm happy to, um, to look into that. But uh, we'll be making further announcements on that soon. What, what, what are those further announcements? Uh, a further announcement. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what would be behind the shortage of rats? What, what would we take that? Oh, well, it could be several things. Um, it could be supply. Obviously, it could be demand. It could be expiry rates. Uh, there could be a, it could just be a distribution issue that we just don't have them in the right part of the country. Um, I'd have to look further into uh, any examples of, uh, of rats not being available. Just one more. Uh, can we expect that the government will continue uh, to 
funds free for the veterans and boosters beyond June 30th? Uh, we received funding in the budget for that. Uh, about 232 million um, was uh, for the COVID vaccine. It was also for the uh, antivirals and uh, there was some surveillance in that as well. So, so that is certainly our intention at the moment. And there's no change to the eligibility? No, that will remain as it is at the moment, yeah. Minister, um, just back on radiology, could you talk a little bit about your own experience um, as a doctor and what you've seen around the challenges and expecting um, what, what you've worked with? Yeah, re really, really frustrating <clears throat> um, to have the two appointments, uh, to wait first of all to see a specialist and then get there and then be told, uh, oh, you need a CT scan, or oh, crikey, if I'd have turned up with my CT scan, we could be starting today, uh, sort of thing. And uh, ACC had partly figured this out. <clears throat> they have protocols, and we're borrowing some of their high technology protocols <clears throat> so that we can you know, have something similar because it's tried and tested. But uh, you can imagine turning up, well, several things. First of all, you get your scan result and your referring person gets the answer as well. You know even before you see the specialist, oh, this is probably the definitive diagnosis. That's a good thing. You can start some management uh, anyway. Secondly, you then turn up for your first specialist assessment with most of the tools that he or she is going to need to make a definitive diagnosis. You can progress straight into the pathway from there. So that this will really uh, reduce time frames, improve patient care, and this is why GPs have been calling for it for some period of time. Do you foresee a, a deepening in equities at all between um, uh, Dr. Subaka and Maori? And Look, that's really interesting. <clears throat> I think uh, for those out in, uh, in rural communities, <clears throat> uh, particularly, where uh, they may not, uh, are unlikely uh, to have access, for example, to, in fact, uh, the MP, uh, Tim Costley and I were talking about this as we came in, that uh, of the two options here, where we are here today, uh, one could be through that referral process to the nearest hospital, that is some distance away, or to a private provider, which is a good deal closer. This mechanism would potentially help with that. Just going back to that um, research you were talking about earlier, do you accept um, that GPs there are significant burden when patients Yes, I do. Yes, I do. That's exactly what happens. If you, if you can't get access to the system, it falls back on primary care. You've reached out because you either don't have the skills or you're wanting further guidance, and, and it comes back to you. Um, and then in my experience, what you often do if you can't get a physical and in, in, you know, face-to-face appointment with a patient, you pick up the phone and speak with the specialist. Look, uh, this has been declined or this is now a long pathway. Uh, what would you suggest I do here now, either in the interim uh, or uh, is there any other way that I need to act or things I need to do to get this patient seen? That, that's actually what you do. Do you Why agree you? with the move <clears throat> up sick leave for part-time workers? I don't know the details of that, so I'm, I'm not going to offer a comment on it. Um, I have seen some of uh, the sick leave proposals, but um, I haven't formed a view or been briefed on it uh, at this point. Mm. Can I just, in your announcement, you spoke about how this uh, money for radiology will go towards uh, supporting your health targets, right? Mm. No, what we've had is um, we've had uh, indications from across the sector uh, that, uh, and from very experienced uh, health management people that just as I've described to you, uh, the change in workflow uh, with this announcement, particularly for first specialist assessments, um, will make a difference. So can I give you a percentage different? Uh, no, I can't, but uh, we just know by changing the workflow in this way and you know, that we'll get improvements and we'll expect to see that as we roll it out. Why are you going to um, only train 25 new doctors? Uh, because uh, we can't do everything uh, in one budget, and um, we have intentions to complete that in further budgets. So we, we did half here now. Is this another broken promise? No, uh, we did uh, 25 of the 50, and as we said, in further budgets, we'll, uh, we'll deliver the others. But what, why, was, why was there that cut in half? Uh, because we can't afford to fund everything in health. I mean, we've walked into a 1.77 billion uh, fiscal hole, and we just couldn't afford to fund everything in our first budget. Is there any possibility at all that funding could be allocated for those drugs before the next budget meets the cancer drugs? Uh, you'll have to wait for further announcements on that. Uh, but I, I, there is a possibility? Uh, look, I, I don't want to be in front uh, of the announcements we want to make. Um, having said that, we want our communications to be improved. Um, we want to be uh, better with that and better with our, uh, our accuracy. So uh, you'll just have to wait for that announcement. Where do you, where do you think the, the fault lay with that communication? Are you frustrated by it? Uh, look, I, I think probably I wear some of that, and I think as a team we wear some of that. Um, it, it's more recognising that we could have been better with communication. How do we make it better? And so, so if, if, if you're saying you recognise you could be better with communication, you'll tell people that there's an announcement mm -hmm. soon. Have you got any timeline on that? 
not at this point just soon, but we're working at pace uh, for that announcement. Is there any issues with naming the drugs and Pharmax bargaining power? Like, does that cause any delays? Not as we've been um, uh, progressing uh, the announcement that we're looking to make, so no. Could you see any of those certain drugs change, like given the time frame between actually getting them I, I understand what you're saying there, and um, we're taking advice on that, but we campaigned and committed to those treatments, and so uh, that's what we're looking to deliver. But my guess is, you know, over time, better... Uh, I understand what you're saying, but uh, this is what we campaigned on, and this is what we're committed to delivering. Mm. Can I just ask you about the profession of the <laughs> <laughs> um, Polydor, you know, right. you're in a hospital, uh -huh. you know, we're talking about radiology and stuff like that. There's a community in that space here, the low, lower decile areas, and, and a lot of high Māori and Pacific population. Is there anything here that is coming from the, the health services that are going to be able to support what you just announced here today, like cancer mm -hmm. treatment, radiology? Mm -hmm. Is there anything, because the barrier for us as a community that we work in is getting to these places and is there, you know, up valley of Wellington, mm -hmm. but Polydor in itself is its own little city and its own little barriers in itself. Is there anything? So well, we're going to uh, roll this out uh, across the whole country because what, what, what we want you to do is exactly what you're describing, harmonise the access to this everywhere, no matter where you live. So we're looking to address that with this announcement. Uh, furthermore, just last week, uh, we met with uh, Helmut and his team uh, from Wartotoa to figure out uh, what Kinderpuru might look like. So um, we're already already working working hard on that. But to answer your prime question, uh, for those who live away from services, uh, this announcement here today is to try and even that up to make it more fair. Very good. Uh, just, just, thank you. Yeah, just, just a question about the uh, practicalities of um, 